introduction. Um, good to, to have me here. Um, yeah, today, uh, as you already introduced, we're going to talk about um, the cloud workspace, um, about the product Workspace 365, a bit of uh, introduction to the product as well, who am I and what's happening in the market as well. So that, that's very relevant. Um, and how do you actually combine those techniques into one um, good workspace? Uh, because what you're seeing in the market is happening is specification, a lot of cloud apps, a line of business applications, um, uh, tradi traditional legacy applications, and how are you able um, as an IT admin to combine that for your users? So you, you see a, a lot of different portals and how you can combine that way. So that's something we're gonna uh, get back at. Um, what is the best way to configure? How do you create an ad adaptive workspace? Um, we're really keen into the adaptive part because um, yeah, you see a lot of more uh, bring your own device, uh, mobile forces engaging. Um, you slightly have maybe other intentions on different kind of devices. So if you're running on your mobile, you do not want uh, a lot of information about certain stuff you only do on the desktop or you do not want to be bothered by uh, uh, some, some applications like a line of business application that you shouldn't even start and allow to start on your mobile. So that's how we uh, take a look um, um, to it as well. And of course, we have some uh, stuff going by uh, and, and some time for questions as well. So first, let me introduce myself. Um, already had some slight uh, introduction started uh, uh, four years ago um, at uh, the company Workspace 365. Right now, product manager and success maker. It's a slight um, um, yeah, a split role uh, because we only deliver our product via IT companies and we see that um, those IT companies deliver the whole workplace and we only deliver our workspace. So what I'm doing all day is talking to IT partners all over the globe, um, how we can enhance with this modern technology Office 365 SharePoint Online Exchange, uh, uh, Citrix, uh, Windows 32 Desktop, for example, but as well as SAS applications. How can you build that together and make it a technical success? And based on that, we have a lot of product uh, uh, updates and, and introduction and whatsoever. So Workspace 365, we started in 2010. So it's not that we are quite new. Um, right now active over 16 countries with the main focus in the Netherlands. And as I already mentioned, we have around um, right now 110 uh, white labels partners that uh, sell our product. And we do that uh, in the Netherlands, Nijkerk, it's a small uh, village town um, but we're, of course, a Dutch company, Dutch founded, uh, uh, fully Dutch operating. So if I make a slight introduction to uh, what's happening in the market and what we're doing, basically, um, I already called the adaptive workspace. So if you take a look at uh, what we're doing with the IT partners, we're trying to boost MSPs. We're trying to boost them with our products by simplifying work. Um, we see a lot of stuff being complicated, like I already introduced different kinds of portals, different kinds of applications, and how can you combine and manage that uh, um, um, applications together? We do that by simplifying work with an adaptive workspace. It's fully role-based, it's from the cloud, it's uh, instead of the starting point, your desktop, it's the starting point from um, the browser, basically. So a fully cloud-based browser. So what we're seeing in the market, I rather tell you about uh, bring your own device, choose your own device, um, combining and simplifying Office 365. We have to um, start RDP. We have to integrate a legacy like file servers or line of business applications. So more and more you see that uh, it used to be that you're running a Tin client and connecting an RDP session or a Citrix session and running your desktop uh, from there. But they're rarely uh, expensive licenses and you have to maintain all the infrastructure in the back end or whatsoever. And yeah, the question is how you need to deal with your uh, SaaS applications, for example. How are you able to manage those within that environment? So that's, that's stuff what we're seeing, uh, single sign-on as well. Uh, you want to upgrade the legacy systems, um, the client market declining, 
bring your own device, choose your own device, Office 365, uh, whatever I told you already. So this is the stuff we're seeing in the market. And how we see the market is um, we love to refer to pizza. At least I do. I'm in love with pizza. Um, you see the market uh, as software and hardware. You have a lot of ingredients. So you have tomatoes, you have cheese, you have basilica. Um, and those need to be prepared at some way or need to deliver it to the IT companies. And how do you do that? How do you package it? How do you maintain it and control it under, um, uh, one, on one pizza? So that's what Workspace 365 is for. You can imagine if you just drop all ingredients on the pizza without any uh, certain or good preparation as an IT chef, um, no one wants to uh, eat a rare uh, uh, pizza dough. So it needs a preparation, it needs a certain time in the oven, on a certain temperature, um, with certain ingredients. Maybe you want to have extra NNS, uh, pineapple, or uh, cheese being added to the pizza. Um, that way, um, not a whole organization is being delivered by the pizza with the pineapple, but slices of pizza to certain user groups. So that's what you see in the bottom as well, that an employee has a part, a slice, a persona, what we call, um, of pizza to the, uh, for the organization. So it's not if a certain person only needs a full desktop or only needs the pineapple, that the whole organization needs to eat pineapple that way. So if we take a slight look uh, and, and from the top first, uh, we have the generic sales implementation process. So you have the sales cycle, demo, POC contract, uh, champagne uh, um, bottle pops. Um, technical wise, you need to start stuff, uh, migration, workspace renewal, uh, and the adoption part of the workspace. Well, rather that's, that's the old fashioned way. You really want to go to the people change management. And that's what I'm doing all day and uh, with our partners as well. How can you uh, create a better adoption and a better um, um, integration from that modern workspace? So you still have the, the same cycle, but instead of um, doing adoption in the back end, you're doing adoption all over the time. Start uh, discussing and, and contacting um, end users. Start talking about, hey, uh, what are you using for your daily uh, work. Um, are you using Spotify, for example? It's a rarely managed application. Everyone knows Spotify, but if 80% of your users is using Spotify on a daily basis, just as extra, uh, maybe some, some podcast listing, but as well as just besides their work, why you shouldn't offer it in the, uh, the workspace. So it's an ongoing people change management where you need to, to know what people are using instead of just saying like, hey, this is your workspace, you need to work this way. Because if you do it that way, you definitely get some friction and people are seeing like, um, oh, I, I rather cannot do, uh, do uh, this kind of work what I could before. So it totally depends on the changing uh, way of work. And, and because of um, early school leavers or, or uh, how we say like a millennials right now are coming into the, the workforce, um, group they used to like dropbox uh, google drive uh, they used to work in projects they used to work to sales applications so we have a slight of mix of all the workforce and and millennial workforce that you need to combine into one uh, good workspace that way so what i like to show to you guys is right now the workspace um so i already created um a workspace for you guys um, right now, that's Workspace365 or stable.workspace365.me slash quick start. So um, this is our workspace. It's still empty. I registered uh, it with um, my Azure AD account, my Office 365. It's fully single sign-on. And I created it based on OA2. So we're creating an app registration in Azure AD. And that way... Uh, everything that we connect to the workspace is fully single sign-on in the back end. So entering SharePoint, uh, Exchange, um, Power BI, Delve, whatever you're connecting to Azure ID is fully single sign-on. So what I like to show to you guys is if I'm entering the settings, you see just um, 
the workspace being split uh, in, in two parts. You have the user part and the workspace part. And what we're trying to do right now is build together the best workspace and to see how elements work and shift into together and, and simplify work. I first want to dive into SharePoint documents. So if we take a look into SharePoint documents, um, as an admin, we're able to configure certain stuff. So we could choose to open files in local applications for those users. Um, what's happening um, if you do it this way, an extra button uh, is being displayed that the user is able to open files in the local editors. So I can set the default for uh, preference for opening files. And what you need to do, I already talked about the pizza slices and the personas. You need to think and inventorize how many users are running a local desktop. How many users are running um, maybe Microsoft E3 uh, with a Pro Plus installation? So that's everything you need to question beforehand. So if you do this part, uh, please take into account that you have personas and, and understand your users correctly, what they're doing and what they're using. So right now I leave it uh, as default on the Office online apps. I can choose to allow, uh, allow and hide show and reorder libraries. Um, this is because of we just uh, uh, connect everything based on permissions from the SharePoint channel. So if you have an Office 365 site, if you have a team site, uh, or you have a, just a, a, um, a site collection, everything is listed based on your permissions. We do not maintain any permission on this part. It's just uh, SharePoint permissions. So that way a user is able to hide and show uh, certain libraries. We're gonna, I, I'm going to show it uh, to you guys in a minute. Next, uh, you can set the user is able to sync their um, files to the local device. It's just a button to um, OneDrive. So it's not that we're syncing anything at all, but it's a setting that you can do as an admin to um, get for users to sync stuff to their device. So if we take a look to the front end, we already made some changes um, and we're going to add the document style. Right now, I'm going to look to the SharePoint integration. Right now you see my document style being configured and you see just a uh, several documents. And these are the recent documents from my SharePoint. So what I'm seeing here is documents that I opened, that I shared, that I um, edited and whatsoever with the location. I can perform uh, actions from the context menu here. Um, you can say like open in Word Online, open in Word Local. I can even open the file location or in general, I could say open documents. If I take a look right now at the documents app, like I already told, it's connected to SharePoint in the backend and it lists everything that I granted access for. You see on the left, my documents and my documents is the OneDrive for business. So it's automatically being listed and all the other sites as well. So what can I do here? If I have my test document right here, I can say like I open it in Word Online, I can open it in Word or even set an open preference. But if I open right now in Word Online, you'll see I'm going fully single sign on to the document, hello world, test editing, and I can just easily close it once again and my documents being updated in the backend. It's the Office 365 um, editors, and you can even choose to open it in Word locally if your Word is installed locally, of course. So, Documents across different kind of locations, different kind of sites, uh, the same interface people used to. You're already seeing if we're browsing into SharePoint and OneDrive, if you're familiar with that, that's a totally different kind of interface. You need to switch to new and old interfaces all over the time. What we're trying to do is have a simplified uh, overview across different kind of locations. So right now, OneDrive for Business, SharePoint, uh, but as well, file, file server. So you're able to configure your file server as well. So in a hybrid scenario where you still need to enclose your file server and you want to migrate to SharePoint, but you have different kind of migration paths, of course. Some will take uh, a few months, but some will take years. Uh, and some is even used for archiving, so can never be done. 
and you always need to make your file server available. So um, you can do that into the workspace uh, by using our file server integration. Same interface, same power of your um, documents in the same interface indeed. File server history, or sorry, version history, I must say, um, that's uh, of course SharePoint functionality, but we're integrating it in the most relevant functions into the workspace, what you can do, sharing, managing, copying, um, and that's interesting as well. Um, if you're running your file server and integrating your file server, we can even copy across different kinds uh, of sites and locations. So you can copy from your file server to OneDrive or from your OneDrive to SharePoint, SharePoint, vice versa, it doesn't matter at all. So that's a really powerful tool to maybe start migration uh, for your users. And the way you say like, hey, the traditional home folders are being enlisted into the workspace and you can start migrating for the coming two months maybe uh, to your OneDrive for business. And the rest is being handled by the IT management in the backend. So that's, that's really powerful what you can do. Um, how you can open documents, integrate documents, of course, creating folders. Uh, right now, there's nothing listed here, but I can create folders. I can create documents. Um, I can choose to, to create PowerPoint, uh, open it PowerPoint online, PowerPoint local, whatever you used to. And as I already mentioned, um, people can just show and hide libraries if they like to. So it's really powerful if you just a member of hundreds of, of sites because that happens when you're running um, maybe Microsoft Teams or Office 365 groups, you're getting a member of a lot of sites. So this way you can even say like, as a user, I'm going to hide it. So that's something about the Documents app. And if we take it a step back once more to our space, what we're trying to do is not trying to replace SharePoint. Um, it's still SharePoint functionality in the back end. It's not that we're trying to, or even we're copying SharePoint. It's one or, uh, to one, it's an API integration. So uh, like I already told you about the permissions, etc., that's being performed in SharePoint. But what you can do as well, and what we're trying to do is pull out the most relevant information and put that into your dashboard, your starting point, your workspace. And if you want to, to do some advanced stuff, you can navigate to SharePoint, you can do that. You can also work locally if you like to. Um, what I'm doing uh, sometimes as well is running uh, OneDrive locally that syncs up all my team sites and OneDrive as well. Um, but still, if I'm on the road, uh, when I'm on my notebook, on my mobile, I need to access my documents. Um, I'd rather not navigate to SharePoint or OneDrive and, and vice versa. I always access my workspace. It's a collection of everything I need on a daily basis into the workspace, the most relevant uh, even as well. So I can create documents from this lifestyle. We're pulling out that, that most relevant stuff uh, being done already from your da dashboard, from your starting point. So, so far the documents. Um, I like to uh, step uh, to email integration. So what we can do as well is integrate with um, Exchange Online uh, and Exchange on Brands. So um, Exchange Online is the, the easiest way to go. It's fully uh, automated, uh, fully automated. You do not have to configure anything about it. Um, I can already add the email tile right now as I do so. And I'm creating the email group and I'm saving it. And you will see directly my email box is listed. So we did the same with the email as we did with the documents. So we created the application um, with an easy interface on top of your exchange. Again, this is exchange. It can be used on your Outlook locally. It can be used in uh, OWA if you like to. But in the workspace, we just get rid of all the, the stuff, that's, um, um, stuff that's not needed for kiosk workers, front end workers, people that just start to write emails and, and do basic uh, stuff that's not needed to be uh, using categories and rules and, and all of the, those stuff, but just the necessary stuff and clean stuff into the workspace. 
but still of course the most important features can be done you can uh, drag and drop as well and move items um, you can choose to create new emails um, add extra signatures insert documents um, you rather like to go to to links of course um, because you do not want to share different kind of versions of documents but you can choose to um, add your documents for, across all configured uh, um, document locations within the workspace. So you will see here your file server, your OneDrive and your SharePoint. So that's really powerful to combine those different kinds of sources in a hybrid scenario within the workspace. So you can as well, what I told you with the um, new document uh, option, that's what we're doing as well with new email. But you um, get a pop-up, you get a dialogue to create a new email because we want to pull out that, that good process, the quick process that you like to start uh, creating new emails, that you like to do, do stuff very uh, rapidly and quickly into the workspace. Instead of first navigating to your email app, starting uh, to click on new uh, email and then composing the new email only if you want to send one email. So we're pulling out that process into the front, uh, into your dashboard, what you can do directly straight on for, from this overview. So that's about email. And now I'd like to move um, to user management with you guys. So what we're doing um, is connecting to Office 365. I can easily import users from Office 365. But right now I say like, hey, I'm importing Sarah the Freeze. It's a typical Dutch name. Um, but I'm imported right now and she's present in the workspace. So that's it. She can sign in. She can even single sign on uh, to the workspace because we configured it that way. And I will show you later on as well. Ideally, um, you would like to sync up all users from Azure AD because you want to have identity management in one place. So that way, what you can do is use our sync tool. I'm not going to set it up with you right now, but we have uh, tons of documentations about it. I advise you to take a look at it. But what we do with that sync tool, we sync all groups and users based on domains and security groups. So you can just select which groups you like to sync to the workspace and what's happening then is if you make a user member from your on-premise AD or uh, from your um, Azure AD, wherever you're configuring it, um, make a member of, for example, the marketing group, it's being fully automatically uh, synced into the workspace. So the user has all the applications that they're granted access for. You do not have to configure anything in the workspace. It's the first initial setup that you need to do. And that's why you need to define personas once again. Right now, I'm creating um, groups manually, and let me just uh, call it like uh, finance, and I create members of it, or assigning members, and it's the admin and Sarah. I'm done, and I create another group, and let's say like a sales force. That's my application, and let me explain it a bit. Finance is a member of my application group. So ideally, I end up with a split of different kind of groups. First, of course, with my security group, my, my function groups, my user groups, you can say. And the other is the application groups. Both are, of course, security groups in your Azure ID. But it's really um, uh, cool to have to split this way because you can publish applications and, and create a role-based uh, uh, workspace uh, very nice uh, if you have it this way. So what you maybe already saw, if we uh, open the group, you can assign different kind of permission to certain groups. So you do not want to end up um, people asking over to, all over the time to create some applications for the other department maybe. So you can use delegation of control. You can create apps in uh, App Store. So you can even create an admin group and say like, hey, that admin group is allowed to create applications in the workspace or maybe create shared tile groups. Uh, or maybe the HR department that creating announcements in the workspace. So you really can, can have delegation of control to a certain uh, set of users based on those groups. 
And what you can do as well, um, enable kiosk mode for certain uses. So what you see is what you get. You cannot change anything. So once you did the setup of the user and group management, um, you like to move, of course, to the App Store. Um, for me, it's of course, but let me explain it. The App Store is present on top or on the left. What we can do here is create applications as the in name state, of course. So you already saw me adding documents and email, and those are tiles. But the tiles are based on applications. So if I'm trying to add a tile right now, you see a bunch of tiles listed here that I'm granted access for. So it's only available if I have access. Those tiles are based on applications in the App Store. And as an admin, you're only able to create applications. Regular users are not able to create applications in the App Store. And what you can see, we created a bunch of applications already. Um, you can add your own applications, of course, because this, this is just yeah, nice productivity, but you want to get started with different kinds of applications. Your, um, um, your sales applications, your line of business applications. So what you can do, you can add applications based on these six principles. So first of all, shortcut. Um, it's fairly easy. It's a shortcut. You navigate to, to your website, workspace365.net, uh, facebook.com, uh, whatever you're using, it's just a shortcut, salesforce.com. What you can do as well is adding an Azure app. So Azure has a, um, a gallery with enterprise applications that already configured single sign-on. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it's approximately um, two and a half to 3,000 uh, already pre-configured connections with SAML, OpenID, whatever you're using. Um, but as well, you can choose to go for password-based single sign-on. So that way you need a plugin, but your application is um, semi-single sign-on if the application itself is not ready for it. So uh, you record the sign-in fields, the, the username, the password, and the submit button. And you can use different kind of single sign providers for that as well. So like uh, Hello ID, um, Secure Login, NetIQ, Okta. So a lot of those products um, do work in the workspace as well, fully sign, single sign-on, if you connect them to Azure AD. So in the, in the end, that's the whole story, connected to Azure AD, and you're able to fully single sign on and automate it from the workspace even. Clientless RDP, um, that's our uh, HTML5 integration of RDP. Um, so you rather like to go for remote app instead of the full desktop. So what you prior see is that people are running a full desktop, starting the line of business application, if they're even using, could be only Outlook, could be Excel, Word, PowerPoint and the Office Suite. Um, and then browsing next to it. Well, if you're just maintaining a lot of uh, different kind of servers, you know what's happening if users do it that way. Open Chrome, open 15 tabs. Well, your server load is increasing a lot, a lot, a lot. So what you're trying to, to do, and, and that's the trend what we're seeing, trying to move instead of uh, from, thin, uh, from thin clients to fat clients, move and use the local power of the machine. So if it's still uh, uh, mandatory, necessary to start uh, um, some line of business application, just go for the remote app where you can just publish it into the, the uh, HTML5 version. But you can choose to use Windows Virtual Desktop as well if you like to do that. Citrix Senap, we made an integration with that as well. Um, Citrix Senap, um, the integration is uh, um, fully on, on the single sign-on connection from Citrix to Azure ID. Uh, our integration detects if there's a local receiver available for the user or it needs to start the HTML5 version of the app. So this is a really cool integration as well. Um, the web content, everything that you can embed. So that could be a YouTube feed, could be a Spotify playlist, could be Google Maps, could be Tableau or Twitter, uh, whatever you're able to, to embed, it's just an iframe, you can post it into the workspace. But here's where the power comes as well. If you're developing or maintaining your own uh, line of business application, maybe you're able to embed some certain stuff into that web content app as well. 
So you can build a really cool workspace and a powerful workspace uh, uh, from the web content tile even as well. And the last, uh, we can create uh, local Windows applications. So you're able to uh, start your local applications. Um, yeah, I have a tons of uh, listed here in my taskbar, but I could choose to start Teams locally, start my soft phone, uh, start whatever application I'm using. And you can even pass arguments and, and uh, with that stuff as well. So if you're trying to open uh, Explorer, for example, locally, you can choose to uh, open a certain drive or open a certain folder that way. Um, I already mentioned clientless RDP about connecting to RDP. If some users need to run it, um, an MSTSC, for example, you can powerfully do that with the local Windows app. So you can start MSTSC local with some certain uh, arguments like connecting to this RDP file or uh, maybe directly to, to just a host address. Um, you can build it with the local Windows app. But right now, let's take a look at shortcut because the basics of every app are uh, the same, uh, depending on the configuration, of course. So here we have the shortcut application. Um, applications consist of an icon, and a color, the name, and of course the configuration. I have a whole list of icons being listed right here. And I guess I'm used uh, Salesforce. There you go. It's already present. But if it's not present, I can upload uh, the icon uh, really easy. So right now uh, we call the uh, app uh, Salesforce. And I leave it as an easy web app, Salesforce, if that's the URL. And then I can choose who has access to it. Of course, I right now want to assign the Salesforce group to that application. I choose to um, have owners or not. Uh, what you can do with owners, you can choose a group to be uh, or uh, able to be able to create applications or to create shared app groups, what I uh, previously showed to you here in the back end. Um, what you can do as well, you can create someone uh, or grant someone ownership over an app so that uh, people are able to configure uh, the app itself. Uh, maintenance, um, previously, of course, um, if you had an app in maintenance, um, you send it out an email. You send it out the email to people and like, hey, this app is in maintenance. Uh, yeah, do not try to enter because you're probably uh, getting some errors that you do not understand. And um, you know what's happening at the service desk. People are calling, hey, this application is not working. And then you guys say like, hey, uh, but I emailed you. And the end user says, oh, I did not solve it or um, asked to complicate it for me. I did not understood it. So they're totally missing the point of the stuff being uh, in maintenance. So what you can do and what we built, it's really for the user perspective that we gray out the town. You're not able to access the application. And you can set the maintenance from start on and on with some additional notification message. So if the user clicks it, they will prompt it like, hey, the, uh, the maintenance is being scheduled. You can use the application uh, not from starting uh, X to ending Y. And that grain out is being uh, used as well in the conditional access. And this is really powerful. You can build really adaptive workspaces with this. And, and it's really cool. I like it a lot. But by default, you can say the tile is grayed out and it's like, Hey, the, the application, the local application, I maybe already talked about, is like if you want to start Teams locally, maybe it's only available on desktop, or maybe it's only av uh, available on Windows. Or even if I would like to uh, uh, have a step further, it's only available on Internet Explorer, or because you're running ActiveX, for example, with a certain website. This way you can, can uh, reduce the service calls on applications at your side because you're just performing uh, uh, the user with information that's relevant. Like, hey, uh, this application is not configured to use in Chrome, please use Internet Explorer. That way, the user is already notified instead of just calling you guys and, and uh, into inserted seats with errors uh, why the application is not working. You can even define on whitelist, uh, blacklist, IP address, internal, external, um, we even have some partners 
uh, created really cool uh, a solution with this that people only see their application that uh, on that uh, a location of the company. So they're switching a lot of locations. Um, so uh, you won't see all application. You granted uh, access to all applica every application, but you only see the, the application that's relevant for that location. So it's really cool and really powerful to to um, yeah build build access to your application. Keep in mind, we do not change anything, of course, to um, the security of the application. So if you're trying to do this to salesforce.com, uh, like I'm configuring right now, uh, of course, nothing will happen. You're still able to access salesforce.com in a new tab. But in the end, from the workspace on, it's not uh, uh, accessible. So I save the application and then I navigate back. And if I take a look right here into the tiles, it should be listed and there you go because I'm granted access for. So I'm editing right now to the workspace and as I did with documents and email, you see that it's listed in a tile group. But right now we have two differences. This one is a personal tile group. And right now I created a new shared group and that new shared group, uh, how I'm going to call it is finance. So, What's the difference? The personal, as the name already states, is personal. A person can remove, resize, uh, um, delete, add tiles, whatever they like to, to personal groups. But then shared groups is maintained and controlled by the admin. That way you're able to publish uh, to a certain group of users some uh, tiles and even um, keep control over it. So what I'm doing right now I'm granting finance access to the finance group. And I granted Salesforce to the Salesforce application. And that's why you need to build those two layers. You can say like on a tile level with one application, um, we check both uh, permission layers. So if you have an extra app being added into the finance group and everyone has access to finance, but not everyone has access to Salesforce, you will only see the, the tiles that you granted access for. So that way you can uh, build really powerful uh, uh, spaces based on roles and based on personas that you already inventorized in the, uh, beforehand. So right now, of course, you'd like to see um, how it's be or, or what the user experience is. And right now I'm opening Sarah, opening the workspace with Sarah that we previously imported into the workspace. So this is the first user experience that I'm having as Sarah, as a new user into the workspace. You will see that my email configuration succeeded. And my workspace is totally set up, completed, and I'm ready to go. And as I already configured, the, share, the finance group, the shared uh, app group is being published to Sarah because she's a member of finance. And if I'm trying to edit my workspace right now, you will see that it's grayed out. I cannot change anything about that group. So it's really powerful to, to take off control, remain control over that application. So besides that, you do not always have to publish application to people's spaces. Um, what I can imagine as well, I uh, took it as a sample in the beginning, Spotify, for example, that you want to create certain applications and certain tile for users, but do not want to publish it, you can just create it and leave it as it is and do not publish it on the dashboard because users are being notified that they're granted access to certain applications. So right now I'm notified that Salesforce is available for me. So I can easily edit as myself uh, to my dashboard if I like to in a personal group. So right now I'm going to show you, uh, besides the, the, the managed groups and the managed stuff, um, of course you want to see uh, the email and documents being published to that user group as well. So what I can do as an admin, I can say like, hey, my workspace is a template. I want to publish it to everyone. And if I right now refresh Sarah's dashboard or a space, you will see instantly that I granted access to documents and email. So um, I can resize this tiles. I can say like, hey, Sarah, I like to have it this way. And this is my personal dashboard. So 
you do not have control over the shared groups, but you still have control over the personal groups. If you're starting configuring and creating tiles everywhere, um, of course, you, you end up maybe with a list of, of um, live tiles. So you can uh, create RSS information from your SharePoint site. You can create uh, YouTube videos. You can create everything you like to um, um, in, in this dashboard. Uh, then you end up maybe with a whole list of different kind of applications. So what we did, we created different kind of spaces. You can create a shared space where you say like, hey, I want to create a finance space. And in this finance space, I only want the finance group to be visible and accessible. So every application from finance is right now listed in the finance space. That's cool because if I take a look at Sarah right now, I'm already shifted and refresh my workspace, you will instantly see that I'm granted access to the finance step. And I cannot do anything, change anything, because it's a shared space. It's controlled by the admin. I can access the applications from here, um, do everything I like to, uh, um, to have my line of business applications here. So you can end up with maybe an internet, uh, social, uh, news feed uh, overview. You could say like, hey, I have a line of business uh, application space. Or you could say like, I'm splitting it by department, by persona, depending on, on everything you do um, that you defined and inventorized already beforehand. So that's how you, you really powerful uh, can build base, a role-based build, of course, um, on Azure AD, on your security groups, uh, our workspace. So right now, if I did set up the sync tool, someone becomes member of finance and has access to Salesforce, they will instantly see that in the workspace as well. It's automatically being synced. Next to that, you maybe like to go a step further. So we created different kinds of applications. We did a lot of stuff. Um, we have a lot of information. Of course, you like to set some extra branding to the workspace. So what you can do is create branding. Well, let me call it a uh, quick start and product name and you can pick a header color well excuse me if i did not pick the correct color but it's just a guess but you can easily discuss it with marketing and um, um, make sure you have the right colors and logos of course but still um, it's really easy to to train uh, and change the branding of some uh, workspace overview as well. You can choose to update the workspace logo and the home logo. The home logo is on the top left and the workspace logo is the logo on the bottom right here. So what I can do is set it as a default branding and default branding is being set for everyone. But what I can do as well, I can assign it to certain groups and users. So, um, Maybe you have some, some charity or foundation that has different kind of entities or municipality that um, uh, has one Azure ID tenant, but still are different kind of companies with different kind of brandings. Well, this way you can easily create different kind of brandings based on departments, on your security groups that you already synced from Azure ID, of course. Um, but that way you can really powerful uh, uh, create different kind of branding sets. Right now, I set it as a default, I'm clicking done, and you will instantly see that my workspace branding is being updated. So of course, my logo on the bottom right is not updated because I do not have the quick start uh, uh, logo uh, available yet, but you can easily uh, upload it that way. And you will instantly see that the finance applications are um, updated by branding accordingly as well. So this way you can easily brand a whole workspace Make it your own because familiarity uh, uh, is, is really important that people recognize their own workspace and, and that it's familiar to them, like uh, icons and application that you're used to. So it's really important to, to discuss the branding as well. Um, I already showed you the app store, the notifications that's uh, listed, but I, what I didn't show to you is the address book. So right now I do not have personal contacts, for the organization, um, what you can do here and list here is the 
PAL and JAL. So the global address list and the personal address list. So it's listed from Azure AD. It's fully single sign-on. I can open the admin. I can say like, hey, I want to call you directly. Um, I want to email you directly. So then we're even starting our email application directly on the go. So what we're trying to do is simplify processes, integrate that instead of switching applications for users all over the time. Because users are tired switching applications, do not know where they need to go, where they need to be present to do their work. They just want to send an email. That's it. So we're really trying to, to improve that and, and being easier on that part as well. Um, yeah, that's uh, what I want to show you about the workspace and the quick guide. Of course, it's way more, more um, uh, not, not complicated, of course, but we have a lot more functions and features uh, that I did not show you and could not show you. But we have our support at workspace365.net where we have a whole list of configuration items, what you can do. I had a walkthrough with you guys through uh, register environment setup. Um, yeah, you can, can do a lot more. And this is ideally what's uh, able, uh, what you're capable of in the workspace, what you can do. Configure a uh, jammer, intranet, uh, single sign-on hosted desktop applications with uh, conditional access maintenance, include your news. Uh, Power BI integrations, uh, Teams to do. So we have a lot of more integrations with Calendar as well and Gemma. It's too much to even uh, say like, but take a look at here. Uh, have a walk through every information that uh, um, is related to the workspace is present here. It's open for you guys. So you can just have a read, take a look at um, uh, our workspace and support uh, dot workspace 365.net. And if you have any questions, you always can, can to contact me, of course. Um, and then we get back to, to the part as well. Um, hopefully it was clear to you. Maybe there are any questions that I can uh, answer already. Um, let me know in the chat right now. That was great, Lawrence. Uh, that was very helpful. Learned a lot even as a marketing manager. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have any questions through as yet. Uh, uh, we usually entertain questions through chat. So if anybody has any questions, they can send it from there and uh, we can forward you them later. Perfect. 